Welcome to the podcast series titled Global Resilience for National Cybersecurity, Strengthening the Interconnections Among Actors. This is Greta Nasi, co-director of the Master of Science in Cyber Risk Strategy and Governance, jointly offered by Bocconi University and Polytechnic of Milan. Together with Professor MacArthur, a joint professor at Bocconi, we discuss with our guests key topics on the role of government and cybersecurity. This project was made possible thanks to a grant from the U.S. Mission to Italy, and it holds the patronage of the Italian Parliamentary Anti-Mafia Commission. This podcast is titled Government Cybersecurity Challenges, From Power and Sovereignty to Essential Services. I would like to thank our speakers, Roberto Baldoni, Director General of the Italian National Cybersecurity Agency, Lorena Bois Alonso, Director for Digital Society, Trust and Cybersecurity, DigiConnect at the European Union, Natasha Cohen, Council on Foreign Relations Term Member, Donatella Asciuto, Vice Rector at Politecnico of Milano, Margaret Smith, Assistant Professor with the Army Cyber Institute at West Point, Stefano Zanero, co-director of the Master of Science in Cyber Risk Strategy and Governance. Digital transformation in cyberspace has shifted many governance processes online, increasing the number of state functions and properties that exist digitally. As more and more government services also change to an online format, citizens and firms increasingly interact via the internet and digital devices. As a result, state mechanisms of power are also increasingly exercised in and through cyberspace. In this era, the information and cyberspace domains are becoming the focal point of conflict between nation states, increasing the need for strategic and comprehensive cybersecurity policies. This podcast addresses the state of the art of cyber strategies It discusses the key issues that have to be considered, the governance, and the gaps, and it suggests future positioning of cybersecurity strategies. Maggie, thanks so much for being here. Could we start with a little bit about you and what you do? Yes, thank you for having me. Milan is absolutely beautiful. I'm excited to be here. I am an Army captain, and I'm also an assistant professor at the United States Military Academy, where I work in the Army Cyber Institute. And so uh, speaking on this podcast, I am speaking in my personal capacity. And so the ideas are mine. They're not representative of the U.S. government, the United States Army, or the United States Military Academy. Um, but it should be a great conversation. So from a military perspective, what principles drive the U.S. strategy? You know, What are the big ideas underlying how the military creates its cyber posture? Yeah, that's a great question. And so back in 2010 is when United States Cyber Command was really stood up as its own um, sub-unified command, which means that it was under another combatant command. And so U.S. Strategic Command is the one that it was placed under. And so to give some background, Strategic Command or STRATCOM is the ones that are responsible for nuclear weapons and these global strike capabilities. So that gives you a sense of where the U.S. thought cyber fit as a capability in some cases. Um, and so that really meant that the way that the United States military was thinking about it was as an exquisite weapon that would not be used unless absolutely necessary. And that mentality really persisted through Um, the Obama administration and up through until about 2018. And what it was really about was response and not trying to um, escalate or create tensions within cyberspace, but instead responding to an incident as it happened. And what changed in 2018 is we had a new National Defense Authorization Act, which happens all the time or on a regular basis. But within that act, there were new authorities granted to United States Cyber Command, and it was also elevated to its own combatant command. And so that meant that the person that was responsible for being in command of U.S. Cyber Command now was a 
global combatant commander, um, so akin to U.S. Central Command, Northern Command, South Command, all of that. Um, so that changed what we could do and changed how we could do it. And in addition, our strategy really changed in 2018. And we went from this policy of restraint to a policy of persistent engagement and defending forward. And those two concepts are really interesting. It really speaks to the nature of competition in cyberspace, where unless you're consistently going after maintaining the initiative and doing activities consistently to try and keep your security as good as possible, then you are kind of failing in, in cyberspace. And so we can conceive of that both in corporations as well, like the big multinational banks and firms all have, you know, security operations centers where cybersecurity is a main focus of what they do on a daily basis, in part because digital transactions are how they run things. They're never just going to buy a product and implement it and then say that they're secure and stop there. And so the military shifted its focus from being very reactive, very passive, and very responsive to being proactive and really attempting to understand what adversaries are doing and where threats are emanating from and taking proactive measures at home to build out a more robust infrastructure for the U.S. and for the U.S. military in particular. And I think it's a really interesting concept and the best one that I think is so exciting is our, um, this hunt forward or defend forward kind of strategy that we have or policy that we have underneath the, the cyber strategy. And what Defend Forward is, is it's really two concepts in one. One is temporal, so thinking about timing. And then the other is really the, the geographic. So it's broadened our ability to conduct activities that are ongoing and persistent, both in forward allied partner networks, so that we can see kind of what our adversaries are doing in some of our allied networks. And that also helps build relationships with those militaries and their cyber forces. But also in terms of temporal thinking, it really gets us out in front of threats so that we have a better security posture at home and within our DOD networks so that we can prevent attacks from coming or patch things and do updates and, and understand what could be coming on the horizon instead of waiting for something to happen and then taking action against it. Natasha, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for having me and good morning. I am a term member with the Council on Foreign Relations, which is a foreign affairs minded think tank based in New York and Washington, D.C. with offices around the United States. And my position as a term member allows me to speak about important you know, issues of importance to national security, such as cyber, with our members, our stakeholders and the larger foreign affairs community. So from that perspective, could you tell us a little bit about the principles that underlie the American cybersecurity strategy and policy? Sort of what's the thinking behind the policymaking in action? Yeah, so there's three key tenets that I'm going to describe today. And the first that I'll talk about is the importance of civilian infrastructure. The second is that public-private collaboration that really has come to enable a lot of what we do. And the third is the international collaboration and multinational approach that we try to take across a number of different avenues for cybersecurity. So first of all, with regard to civilian infrastructure. So the United States has thousands and thousands of companies across all 16 critical infrastructure sectors and all of the national critical functions that underpin the economic, national security, and global positioning of the United States and the well-being of its citizens. And so while government uh, agencies, government institutions are important, that critical infrastructure is really what provides the services, goods, and power of the United States and its allies um, for its citizens. And so those companies are really critical to what we're trying to do with cybersecurity. This, you know, the, the core of it, it is national security. Critical infrastructure is national security because that enables everything that we do in, in our country and, and the countries around the world. And so, you know, that, that interaction, the uh, positioning that we have and, and the relationships and the responsibilities uh, that each agency under the United States system is accorded all map back in some respects to what we're doing for critical infrastructure. And so, 
you know, from a dis- at least from a, a Department of Homeland Security perspective, you know, we have responsibility for leading that effort for, you know, guiding the United States strategy towards the protection of critical infrastructure, but also we have responsibility for the protection of critical infrastructure. However, that's a very hard thing to do in in the United States system. And, you know, one of the reasons for that is that we have no actual control over what that looks like. There are agencies within the United States government that have regulatory power over certain areas of critical infrastructure. CISA does not. And the sector risk management agencies, those parts of departments and agencies that have responsibility to manage the risk of certain sectors, do not have regulatory power. And so they have to work with the other areas of government or independently of those areas of government and gain the trust and the collaboration of critical infrastructure to make impact. Um, and that really brings us to the, the second piece, right, that this public-private collaboration piece. And that exists really across two different fronts. Um, the first is with those owners and operators of critical infrastructure. So, you know, you can think of examples of the 16 sectors as the energy sector or the maritime sector or state, local, tribal, territorial organizations. Um, All of these organizations work with DHS. They work with Department of Energy or Department of the Treasury or FBI or NSA or others, depending on what sector they're part of, right? Um, But the second part of that is with the organizations that provide the foundation for cybersecurity, for IT, for security across the ecosystem. And those companies are the network security companies, the um, IT management companies, the operating system providers, the, um, you know, all of those companies that really either provide security to thousands upon thousands of of customers um, and, and sometimes millions. And, and second of all, you know, that, that provide that foundation of, of the IT system. And so, you know, we work across both at, at DHS and, and so do our partners, because that's, that's just a necessity. We don't know everything in the government and it's taken us a long time to realize that, but we're definitely better now for the realization that we, we do need to work with our partners um, and certainly on the critical infrastructure side, because they are not beholden, right, to, to do anything that we tell them to do um, from a, a protection standpoint and a cybersecurity standpoint. Um, you know, and I think the third is the international partnerships and the multilateral approach. So, you know, those international partnerships span across from a DHS perspective, from a CISA perspective, both countries that CISA and the United States have very friendly relationships with and countries that the United States would traditionally not collaborate with as much on the international national security space. Uh, you know, we have partnerships with hundreds of countries around the world, um, and that is beneficial. It really is because the the threshold for, you know, what we would do with a country from an economic collaboration perspective, from a defense collaboration perspective, is necessarily different than what we would do in a cybersecurity space, where defense of one helps defense of all. And so being able to share that information um, when we need to, how we need to, is incredibly important to what we do and, and one of the, the really core tenants on the DHS side. Obviously, our partners in the Defense Department and the intelligence community have a very different aspect to how they would collaborate with their partners. They have different regulations, different mindsets, um, but that breadth and span and, and um, diversity of thought across the United States government is, is really important. Um, and so, you know, we collaborate with our partners, not just internationally, but domestically to have those international partnerships. Um, and that's something that we do every day. Lorena Bois-Alonso is the Director of Digital Society, Trust, and Cybersecurity at DigiConnect at the European Union. Lorena, if we focus on protecting critical infrastructure and national security, how would you think about the current geopolitical situation in Europe? Does this affect the principles of the EU's strategy? Here, of course, we could have a whole session about uh, uh, the role of cyber. Uh, in this um, uh, in this uh, sad uh, situation and aggression, uh, all type of of uh, theories uh, of whether really we were expecting something bigger on cyber, or if no, on the contrary, that's what we were expecting, or whether really uh, we are witnessing a lot of spillover effects uh, of that, uh, and and indeed uh, we do see. Um, that uh, there are a number of uh, attacks, uh, mainly DDOs, uh, denial of service attacks uh, uh, against neighboring countries. Um, And uh, recently uh, we've seen the case of of Montenegro, Albania, uh, 
but not only. I mean, uh, we've seen uh, also in Italy in May, yeah, um, uh, still this year, a number of, of DDoS attacks uh, against the CISERP. Um, the most notable uh, incident uh, was, of course, uh, the attack on the on the Viasat satellite system, which in fact took place just one hour uh, before uh, the start of the military operations, and which is something that often happens before there is a, a, a kinetic, a physical attack. There is first this this blurring of the of the satellite system. Uh, and there might be very different uh, assessment of what is going on, uh, including in terms of spillovers. But I think that what really it has uh, made us aware is that what potentially it could be. Suddenly there was a, a, a real wake up call of, wow, are we ready if something big happens? And uh, this of course has is, is having an impact. Both type of incidents, this, this constant increase of are we really uh, forgetting that we need to be resilient because there are so many attacks that we don't no longer pay attention uh, and these uh, shaking us of, of, of the military aggression and the spillover effects of it on cyber. Um, these, we need to see whether it has had an impact on our principles on, on, on cyber strategy. And what are our principles? Our principles, uh, and, and some of them have been mentioned, uh, in, in our cyber street strategy are the following. First of all, resilience. Uh, and let's try to be resilient <laughs> in case something happens. So let's try to be as prepared as possible. Uh, second principle is, is technological sovereignty and, and leadership. Uh, this has been mentioned as well. Uh, we need to build our own uh, technological uh, capacities. Uh, third, to be prepared on the operational side. Okay, maybe we build all our resilience, we uh, invest in technologies, uh, but then the thing happens uh, and we have a large scale attack. Are we ready at the European level? Uh, this is what we call the operational uh, readiness. Uh, and here we need to improve, of course, what it, when it comes to detection, uh, to deterrence and response. Uh, and the fourth pillar of our strategy, and was mentioned as well, is, is uh, advancing to a, towards a, a global op and open uh, cyberspace to work with like-minded countries, because uh, when we have a big thing, uh, nobody can work on its own. So we really need to, to, to work together, as, as already mentioned. Let's focus on Italy with the Director General of the Italian National Cybersecurity Agency, Professor Baldoni. What are the priorities driving the Italian cyber strategy at this moment? As it has been said by Margaret before, it's not only, you know, a technical capability that you have to improve. Of course, there, is, uh, the, there are software, hardware behind uh, uh, cybersecurity, but really you have to get into the dimension that we need a cultural shift. We are moving into a new world, which is the digital world, where the rule that applies to the, to the life are very different from the one uh, that we are used to follow in the physical world. So in the physical world, you have someone that uh, when you are very young, alert you, you know, you don't have to do this and that, you don't have to cross the road uh, because, uh, you know, you can be it. Uh, when you think about, and these are quite stable rules, okay? So when you think about the cyberspace, the rules are continuously changes, changing. They change with respect to the technology that we uh, will use now and in the future, and they will change according to the way in which the attacker will decide to attack us. So that's why we really need, you know, a new wave of thinking and the cultural shift with respect to, the, to this new world. And uh, in the national cybersecurity strategy, we try to address uh, many of these parts, thinking about how to protect ourselves, how to um, innovate, how to uh, making more and more 
public and private partnership in order to rise our level of uh, defense. We cannot think to, to rise the level of protection of our cyberspace without including uh, the private sector. This is absolutely insane for a very simple reason. Uh, the private sector run the internet services, uh, they manufacture the devices that we use uh, for creating the internet. So how a government can come and regulate this without talking, uh, without continuously collaborating uh, with the private sector. So we really need to, to change our mind to, uh, to get into this new world and to have a new thinking. Stefano, thank you so much for joining us. And could we start with a little bit about you, who you are, what you're specialized in? Absolutely. Uh, I am a professor of cybersecurity at uh, Politecnico di Milano, and I'm also one of the directors of the joint degree in cyber risk between Politecnico and Bocconi University. Uh, my area of research is in particular focused around the security of cyber physical systems. And so as a natural follow-up, also the protection of national infrastructure is one of my areas of uh, interest. From your research, what are the primary challenges for governments trying to manage this so-called space, this cyberspace? So one of the main challenges is precisely the fact that this is not a real space. Uh, cyberspace is a notion that we use in order to abstract away from the gory details, for gory technical details of how networks work. Uh, we want to understand the exchange of information and we just uh, make use of metaphors, but these metaphors do not translate into reality. Um, cyberspace is actually composed of networking equipment, of computers and servers, and these are owned by private companies and they are operated by private companies mostly. Some uh, small portions of it are managed by non-governmental organizations and very, very limited parts of it are managed directly by a state. So what happens is that uh, it, while a state protects the security of sea, uh, land, air, borders, uh, they are protecting a physical space. And even when they are trying to protect this more abstract uh, national interests, such as economics, for instance, uh, there are very well-defined set of actions that the governments can take. But when we move uh, to critical infrastructure of a nation, uh, the uh, rail transport, uh, airports, uh, uh, airliners, uh, uh, the um, infrastructures for uh, providing water or healthcare, they are all operated by private enterprises in many cases. Uh, they are all operated by organizations that are not the state. And so when uh, uh, an organization is operating, for instance, a power plant, this organization is a potential target of a threat from a foreign nation or from a non-organized, uh, non-state affiliated group that wants to perform a terrorist attack. Now, what happens is that normally the state would be able to provide protection through these uh, entities in the physical space because there's no way to reach directly that uh, entity from the outside. Or uh, if uh, we are talking about uh, um, terrorist threat, there would be the possibility of the police providing physical protection to such, uh, uh, to such uh, uh, plants. Whereas instead, in cyberspace, organizations end up being in the fr on the front of these uh, uh, efforts. And so they may end up in a conflict situation being the ones that are actually protecting critical infrastructure on behalf of the state and of all of us. And this creates an economical short circuit because of course, they may have a very different economic capacity than what is needed to face uh, such uh, an enemy. I'm not uh, thinking of necessarily the industrial giants uh, 
of a nation that may have significant economic capacity. But a lot of companies that end up operating these critical infrastructures are smaller operators. And uh, they may very reasonably uh, pose a question of why they should be protecting their operations beyond what economically makes sense for them, because they are protecting them as a critical infrastructure of the nation. This creates automatically the need for public-private partnerships, and it creates the need for uh, uh, both the military and the civilian agencies uh, tasked uh, with protecting uh, the cyberspace for all of us uh, to actually work uh, with these companies in ways that, in many ways, we are still devising. In the context of this broad ecosystem, what are the EU and member states doing to enhance the resilience of their national security assets and reduce their vulnerabilities? Now, are these pillars being affected uh, I think that we have not changed our strategy, but uh, we have accelerated uh, or made a lot of emphasis on, on, on some of these pillars. Um, if I start with resilience, um, uh, we uh, have been uh, improving uh, our legislation. We do have legislation and, and we do believe in the European Union that there's a role for, for governments. Uh, and one of, of the role that governments can have, uh, and at EU level, uh, we are trying to push, is to, to legislate. Uh, uh, today, there are a number of, of, of critical infrastructures. Uh, some of them mentioned already what happens if uh, our water supplies are, are attacked, uh, our energy, our grids. Uh, um, just, just imagine, I think that you can imagine a, a, a terror film uh, that unfortunately uh, could uh, become reality. So uh, building resilience uh, through legislation of our critical infrastructure and, and our companies by imposing a number of requirements uh, so that they respect minimum uh, security requirements in the way they function. Uh, this is done through what we call the, 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 the NIS Directive, the, the Network and Information Society Directive, and very recently, we, we have updated it and we have reinforced it. We have extended its scope to a number of sectors that were not covered before, uh, including social media, for example, or including uh, labs, for example. Uh, after the COVID pandemic, we realized that uh, laboratories is something that is very juicy for for attacks uh, uh, to, to, to steal uh, intellectual property. So we, uh, the health sector was already covered, but we have strengthened this. Um, and of course, public administration. So uh, to make sure that public administration also take a number of, uh, of, 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 of cybersecurity uh, principles, uh, because uh, when they are attacked, we, we, we all suffer. So we have done this, but there is something that we have done and, and that you will discover next week. Uh, we are going to adopt a new legislative act to deal also with these supply chain attacks, um, at least in an indirect well, uh, we, we, way. We, we call it the Cyber Resilience Act. And what is this doing? Uh, if, if, if you see uh, where most of the attacks come from, uh, most of them, uh, some people say it's up to two thirds of them, and some people go up to 90%, come from, as I was saying before, the exploitation of vulnerabilities in digital products, so very often software. Uh, and this is why what, of course, then creates a supply chain uh, effect. Uh, uh, so if we manage to reduce the vulnerabilities of our digital products, uh, of course, we're going to reduce the surface of attack, uh, knowing that, of course, uh, digital products are only increasing. When I say digital products, I'm, I'm including uh, standalone software. Um, so what we are uh, going to do, and I cannot disclose much because it will be adopted next week, so it's still in the making as we talk, uh, uh, is a piece of legislation that I think for the first time uh, is going to uh, regulate what we, Bulgaria, are, uh, Bulgaria, I don't know if that word exists in English, what we normally call uh, the Internet of Things. So. Uh, that every product, every connected product uh, that is put on the market 
respects a number of cybersecurity requirements. Professor Schutto is the vice rector of the Politecnico of Milano. Professor Schutto, can you summarize the gaps in the current strategies and what's needed to move cybersecurity forward? Most governments have done notable progress. And also with the European Commission that has given a push also to have a coordination uh, in some way among the different states of, the, uh, of Europe. There is a significant gap between the government uh, cyber release, where the government cyber release, resilience is now and where it needs to be. Uh, and this gap is really uh, brought today uh, into sharp focus by the sheer volume of cyber attacks uh, that the government sector is experiencing and the evolving capability and techniques of the broad range of malicious actors conducting them with different objectives as we've seen as we have seen and sometimes it's not so easy to understand the underlying goals of the uh, of the attackers as well as the risk of disruption of government function and public services which target the essential services as, as we have seen in, in in Lazio with the healthcare uh, system and and therefore they really pose a real risk uh, into uh, public safety um, so the problem is that the level of maturity, the capability, the investment and security understanding across government organization remains inconsistent uh, and the size and complexity of the complexity of the digital estates of the governments, including the presence of a lot of legacy IT, which is the most vulnerable part, uh, makes the challenges significantly more complex. And the, the main lack is the fact that there is still uh, not a real understanding of the necessary investment you need to make in system and organization. And these two things go together. You cannot separate them, uh, which is not a cost, but is actually an investment because there is the, the, the most, in most cases, both in the private sector and the public sector is still considered something that is only a pure cost. And so when money is missing, where you cut the cost that you don't understand, where is it uh, necessary? So the size and diversity also of the government supply chains uh, makes it difficult to manage the risk also with the agency, which is trying to do a coordination and providing rules um, and requires still, uh, still a lot of innovation in uh, trying to uh, push the uh, a methodology, a, a framework of assessment, and then a framework for managing uh, the uh, cybersecurity. And again, this requires interdisciplinary skills. This is not something you can do being a specialized software engineer or being only a science, political science expert. You need to be able to put these two things uh, together. Um, you need to be able to uh, make sure that uh, even though we have not so many resources on this uh, type of task, you need to uh, be able to push for a uh, um, comprehensive understanding of uh, the problem, especially now that the COVID has made a huge uh, leap towards uh, digitalization, especially in Italy. Uh, and uh, with the smart working, the uh, surface of attacks has been broadened in an unprecedented way. Um, so to achieve a cyber resilient strategy, the government critical function must be identified, must be uh, significantly hardened to a cybersecurity attack. And the fact that, for example, the idea in Italy is that to have many small data center everywhere is only a, uh, a, a bad scenario for the, uh, for the cybersecurity. The idea to move to the cloud is a good idea, but you need somebody to protect the cloud. You need somebody to be able to, to ensure that the cloud is managed in Europe uh, and, uh, and not from somebody who could be an adversary in, in the future or can misuse your information. You need a cyber security, a cyber risk assessment framework 
defined at the national level that uh, must be able to identify the uh, infrastructures that are public private, uh, but that serve the public function to be able to be to be upscaled in terms of uh, protection uh, against uh, cyber attacks. Overall, all these challenges and complications reinforce the need to look at cybersecurity from a broader perspective, from what we call a public value perspective. In other words, instead of looking at cybersecurity issues in silos like defense or economics, we have to consider the broader values at stake when governments make cybersecurity postures. What really matters and what does that mean for us? Then we look to fill in the gaps that appear when we take this broader view. And this leads us to questions like, how does a government strategy in one area spill over into another? How can we move beyond solely thinking of cybersecurity as the state's responsibility and start thinking about the ecosystem of actors and organizations, individuals who make states secure? Taking this approach will bring us closer to real resilience, not just in particular sectors, but across the entire state. So in the following podcast, we'll further explore what public value-focused cybersecurity might really mean for different important parts of society and from different angles. Thank you to our guests, and thank you to the audience for listening to this podcast. 